but it's a good song. All right, um, we're in the, the kingdom era this evening, and so make sure you have one of those outlines. I'll give you the blanks so you don't feel totally lost, okay? So uh, let me just give you some blanks right now before I get into it so you're all not too tense in regards to it. Uh, the po point of the illustration that I'm about to read is that total freedom does not exist. Freedom comes with the price, okay? So those are the blanks there. Uh, the kings of Israel wanted total freedom, all right? So let me, let me just uh, go reverse and, and uh, go through this illustration here. The kingdom era. You know, if you would be free to sail the seven seas, you have to make yourself a slave to the compass. There's a paradox here. You know, by nature, man desires something that he cannot have, and that's total freedom. You know, there are certain freedoms that we can have, but they have corresponding bondages. You know, and there are certain bondages that, that we can have that, that afford us corresponding freedoms. For example... You can be free from the toothbrush, right? But you'll be in bondage to cavities. It's just how things work. You can make yourself a slave to the toothbrush and be free from cavities, right? And so th there's that paradox. You cannot be free from the toothbrush and free from cavities. That kind of freedom, total freedom, does not exist. So throughout life, we are constantly making choices, and for those choices, we, we pay certain inescapable consequences, right? Freedom comes with a price. That's one of your other, other blanks there, right? The first half. The kings of Israel, they wanted total freedom. Uh, they wanted the freedom to ignore the directives of God and, and, and that, that God had given them on how to rule, how to wage war, but at the same time, they wanted the freedom to have economic and military prosperity, the, they, this was not possible. It just, it's just not how things work. So as a result, during the kingdom era, it was a very turbulent time, many ups and downs. Uh, when a righteous king ruled, the nation would prosper. When an unrighteous king ruled or gained the throne, the nation would falter. So by this time, the barnacles of unrighteousness began to affix themselves on the ship of the Israeli state. And before the books of history were completed, the, the kingdom, the nation had collapsed, and they suffered at the hands of warring neighbors. So here are your blanks, right? So let me just read them to you again. Uh, when a righteous king ruled, the nation would prosper. When an unrighteous king gained the throne, the nation would falter. So here we have the story of the Old Testament. Let's review them very quickly so that, uh, you know, can bring it back to your mind. It's been a couple of weeks here. The first era was the era of creation. The main figure is Adam. Location would be where? Eden. Adam is created by God, but he sins and destroys God's original plan for man. Okay, you should have this repetition is the mother of skill. We've repeated this, at least this first one, five times now. Uh, the second era is the era of the patriarchs. Who's the main character, her figure? Father... Abraham, right? And the location would be Canaan. So Abraham is chosen in that storyline summary there. Abraham is chosen by God to father a people to represent God to the world. So now you know that, that, that storyline. Then the next era is the era of the Exodus. Who's the main character of the Exodus? Moses. And where is the, where's that located? Egypt. All right, and so the storyline summary goes through Moses. God delivers the Hebrew people from slavery in Egypt and gives them the law, made them unique. Everybody caught up? All right, the, the fourth era of the Old Testament is the era of the conquest. Who's the major figure in the conquest? Joshua. And the land or location is Canaan. It's still Canaan, right? The promised land. So Joshua, storyline summary, Joshua leads the conquest of the promised land. And we covered the Judges era next, two weeks ago. The era of the Judges. Uh, Samson is the main figure, or perhaps the most famous of the Judges. They're still in Canaan. It hasn't become Israel yet. So Samson and others were chosen as judges to govern 
the people for 400 rebellious years. All right, and then um, the next era, the kingdom era, David would be the main figure, the main or the greatest king, and location would be Israel. And so we're not going to go through everything, but let me give you the blanks for the, the, the storyline summary of the kingdom era here. David. Okay, David in the summary. David, the greatest king in the new monarchy, is followed by a succession of mostly unrighteous kings. And God eventually judges Israel for her sins, sending her into exile. All right, everybody get those? Let me say it again for the storyline summary. David, the greatest king in the new monarchy, is followed by a succession of mostly unrighteous kings. And God eventually judges Israel for her sins, sending her into exile. And so as has been our custom, we're going to look at four main events or four main characters of each of those eras Today, we're only going to cover the first one, right? The four, we're going to expand the four main ideas of the kingdom era, the United Kingdom, the division of the kingdom, the Northern Kingdom, and the Southern Kingdom. It's just too much to cover in one session. We're just going to do number one in more detail, okay? And we'll go through it a little bit more slowly. But um, if you can remember, Samuel was the last of the judges and the first of the prophets. Um, He will anoint the first king, Saul, Saul will be replaced by the greatest king, David. But we're going to get here into your number one blank there. The United Kingdom, a new monarchy. So turn in your Bibles to um, 1 Samuel chapter 8. How did this all begin? How did this happen? Right? This was the beginning of the kingdoms. Remember the king that was crowned, that will be crowned, that will receive dominion? We, we covered that in Daniel 7 today. But we're going to look at uh, 1 Samuel chapter 8. And instead of rushing through the entire lesson, we'll just do a little bit more detailed study of, of uh, the number one point there, the, the United Kingdom. 1 Samuel chapter 8. I've got to get there. I was in the wrong Samuel. All right, 1 Samuel chapter 8. Um, let me give you the blanks, and then I'm gonna, we're going to read the, the chapter Okay, the 12 tribes of Israel, jealous of other nations around them, are united in their demand to God for a king. So let's read that, what happened there. 1 Samuel chapter 8, verses 1 to 22. And it came to pass, when Samuel was old, that he made his sons judges over Israel, Now the name of his firstborn was Joel, and the name of his second, Abiah. They were judges in Beersheba, and his sons walked not in his ways, but turned aside after lucre, money, and took bribes and perverted judgment. Then all the elders of Israel gathered themselves together and came to Samuel and to Ramah and said unto him, Behold, thou art old, and thy sons walk not in thy ways. Now make us a king to judge us like all the nations." But the thing displeased Samuel when they said, Give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed unto the Lord. And the Lord said unto Samuel, Hearken unto the voice of the people and all that they say unto thee, for they have not rejected thee, but they have rejected me, that I should not reign over them. According to all the works which they have done since the day that I brought them up out of Egypt, even unto this day, wherewith they have forsaken me and served other gods, so do they also unto thee. Now therefore hearken unto their voice. Howbeit yet protest solemnly unto them, and show them the manner of the king that shall reign over them. And Samuel told all the words of the Lord unto the people that asked of him a king. And he said, This will be the manner of the king that shall reign over you. He will take your sons, and appoint them for himself, for his chariots, and to be his horsemen. And some shall run before his chariots. And he will appoint him captains over thousands, and captains over fifties, and will set them to eat to ear or to plow his ground and to reap his harvest and to make his instruments of war and instruments of his chariots. And he will take your daughters to be confectionaries, perfumers, and to be cooks and to be bakers. And he will take your fields and your vineyards and your olive yards, even the best of them, and will give them to his servants. And he will take the tenth of your seed and of your vineyards and give them to his officers and to his servants. 
And he will take your men servants and your maid servants and your goodliest young men and your asses and put them to his work. He will take the tenth of your sheep and ye shall be his servants. And ye shall cry out in that day because of your king, which ye, ha ye have chosen you, that ye shall have chosen you. And the Lord will not hear you in that day. Nevertheless, the people refused to obey the voice of Samuel, and they said, Nay, but we will have a king over us, that we also may be like all the nations, in that our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. And Samuel heard all the words of the people, and he rehearsed them, rehearsed them in the ears of the Lord. And the Lord said to Samuel, Hearken unto their voice, and make them a king. And Samuel said unto the men of Israel, Go ye every man unto his city." So we have the 12 tribes of Israel here, jealous of other nations. Uh, the elders of Israel, they exercise their right for self-determination. And they make a deliberate and a considered request for a king. And God gives them what they ask for. But Samuel essentially warns them, this is what the king is then going to cause your people to do. The king is going to cause your children to wait on him as their kitchen staff, as their footmen, as their soldiers. The king is going to make your, your children work for him as stable boys and messengers your king is going to make your children go to war for him. That's what's going to happen. And so God allows it to happen. God allows Samuel, the first judge, to anoint Saul. Your next blank there. God allows Samuel, the last judge, to anoint Saul to be the first king, beginning a new monarchy. And because Saul is not a righteous king... God does not honor his reign or establish his family on the throne of Israel. So remember what happened to Saul. This is, this is a, a theocratic kingship. There is a king under God. Saul, if you read, we won't read the entire chapter at all, 1 Samuel chapter 10, he's installed as king. He's anointed. He is tested. Let's, let's, let's look at the pattern that happened in Saul's life here that would cause him to lose the kingdom. Turn to 1 Samuel 13. So by this time, he's been anointed as king. He, he begins well, but there is a character flaw. There is a weakness or failure on his part. 1 Samuel 13, one of the first tests that Saul gets here. We'll read 1 Samuel 13, verses 1 to 14. Saul reigned one year, and when he had reigned two years over Israel, Saul chose him 3,000 men of Israel, whereof 2,000 were with Saul in Michmash and in Mount Bethel, and 1,000 were with Jonathan in the Gibeah of Benjamin. And the rest of the people he sent every man to his tent. And Jonathan smote the garrison of the Philistines that was in Geba, and the Philistines heard of it, and Saul blew the trumpet throughout all the land, saying, Let the Hebrews hear. And all Israel heard, heard say that Saul had smitten the garrison of the Philistines, and that Israel also was had in abomination with the Philistines. And the people were called together after Saul to Gilgal. And the Philistines gathered themselves together to fight with Israel, 30,000 chariots and 6,000 horsemen, and people as the sand which is on the seashore in multitude. And they came up and pitched in Michmash eastward from beth Aven. When the men of Israel saw that they were in a strait, for the people were distressed, then the people did hide themselves in caves and in thickets and in rocks and in high places and in pits. And some of the Hebrews went over Jordan to the land of Gad and Gilead. As for Saul, he was yet in Gilgal, and all the people followed him trembling. Right? So now he's put under pressure. He's got to make decisions. Verse 8. And he tarried seven days according to the time that Samuel had appointed. But Samuel came not to Gilgal, and the people were scattered from him. And Saul said, Bring hither a burnt offering to me, and peace offerings. And he offered the burnt offering. And it came to pass that as soon as he had made an end of offering the burnt offering, behold, Samuel came, and Saul went out to meet him, that he might salute him. And Samuel said, What hast thou done? And Saul said, Because I saw that the people were scattered from me, and that thou camest not within the days appointed, and that the Philistines gathered themselves together at Michmash. Therefore said I, The Philistines will come down now upon me to Gilgal, and I have not made supplication unto the Lord. I forced myself, therefore, and offered a burnt offering. So he has now usurped the office of the priest. He should have waited. Now look at verse 13. And Samuel said to Saul, Thou hast done foolishly. That's going to be a key word in Saul's life. Thou hast not kept the commandment of the Lord thy God, which he commanded thee. For now would the Lord have established thy kingdom upon Israel forever. But now thy kingdom shall not continue. The Lord hath sought him 
a man after his own heart. And the Lord hath commanded him to be captain over his people, because thou hast not kept that which the Lord commanded thee. So there's the beginning of the end for Saul here. Let's look at the next test, or another test. Turn to 1 Samuel 15. We'll read verses 1 to 22. So under pressure, he, he does what he ought not to have done. Now he does the same thing, and, and a pattern is beginning to develop. Samuel, 1 Samuel, I'm, yeah, 1 Samuel 15, verse 1. Samuel also said unto Saul, The Lord sent me to anoint thee to be king over his people, over Israel. Now therefore hearken thou unto the voice of the words of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I remember that which Amalek did to Israel, how he laid wait for him in the way when he came up from Egypt. Now go and smite Amalek and utterly destroy all that they have. Okay, there's complete obedience that's required here. Now go and smite Amalek and utterly destroy all that they have and spare them not, but slay both man and woman, infant and suckling, ox and sheep, camel and ass. And Saul gathered the people together and numbered them in Telaim, 200,000 footmen and 10,000 men of Judah. And Saul came to a city of Amalek and laid wait in the valley. And Saul said unto the Kenites, Go, depart, get you down from among the Amal Amalekites, lest I destroy you with them. For ye showed kindness to all the children of Israel when they came up out of Egypt, so that the Kenites departed from among the Amalekites. And Saul smote the Amalekites from Havilah until thou comest to Shur, that is over against Egypt. And he took Agag, the king of the Amalekites, alive, and utterly destroyed all the people with the edge of the sword. But... Saul and the people spared Agag and the best of the sheep and of the oxen of the fatlings and of the lambs and all that was good and would not utterly destroy them but everything that was vile and refuse that they destroyed utterly. And my Bible has the subtitle God rejects Saul here. Verse 10. Then came the word of the Lord unto Samuel saying it repenteth me that I have set up Saul to be king. For he has turned back from following me and hath not performed my commandments. And it grieved Samuel, and he cried unto the Lord all night. And when Samuel rose early to meet Saul in the morning, it was told Samuel, saying, Saul came to Carmel, and behold, he set up him up a place and has gone about and passed on and Saul and gone down to Gilgal. And Samuel came to Saul, and Saul said unto him, Blessed be thou of the Lord, I have performed the commandment of the Lord. And Samuel said, What meaneth then this bleeding of the sheep in mine ears and the lowing of the oxen which I hear? And Saul said, They have brought them from the Amalekites, for the people spared the best of the sheep and of the oxen to sacrifice unto the Lord thy God, and the rest we have utterly destroyed. Then Samuel said unto Saul, Stay, and I will tell thee what the Lord hath said to me this night. And he said unto him, Say on. And Samuel said, When thou was little in thine own sight, wast thou not made the head of the tribes of Israel, and the Lord anointed thee king over Israel? And the Lord sent thee on a journey and said, Go and utterly destroy the sinners the Amalekites, and fight against them until they be consumed. Wherefore then didst thou not obey the voice of the Lord, but didst fly upon the spoil, and didst evil in the sight of the Lord? And Saul said unto Samuel, Yea, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord, and have gone the way that the Lord sent me, and have brought Agag the king of the Amalek, and have utterly destroyed the Amalekites. But the people took of the spoil, the sheep and oxen, the, the chief of the things which should have been utterly destroyed, to sacrifice unto the Lord thy God in Gilgal. And here's the classic verse representative of Saul's life. And Samuel said, Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to hearken than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he hath also rejected thee from being king. There's the pattern, rejecting the word of the Lord. Now let's, let's uh, let Saul, in his own words, describe his pattern of life. Turn to 1 Samuel, verse 26. You say, what's his model for life? We're going to find that out by the end of 1 Samuel 26. 1 Samuel 26. Uh, let's go ahead and begin in verse 1. David has at one point already spared Samuel's or Saul's life. David's on the run. Saul is pursuing. Um, verse 1. And the Ziphites came unto Saul to Gibeah, saying, Doth not David hide himself in the hill of Hakalah, which is before Jeshimon? Then Saul arose and went down to the wilderness of Ziph, having 3,000 chosen men of Israel with him to seek David in the wilderness of Ziph. 
And Saul pitched in the hill of Hekela, which is before Jeshimon, by the way. But David abode in the wilderness, and he saw that Saul came after him into the wilderness. David therefore sent out spies and understood that Saul was coming very deed. And David arose and came to the place where Saul had pitched, and David beheld the place where Saul lay, and Abner, the son of Ner, the captain of his host. And Saul lay in the trench, and the people pitched round about him. Then answered David and said unto Ahimelech the Hittite, and to Abishai, the son of Zeruiah, brother of Joab, saying, Who will go down with me to Saul to the camp? And Abishai said, I will go down with thee. So David and Abishai came to the people by night, and behold, Saul lay sleeping within the trench, and his spear stuck in the ground at his bolster. But Abner and the people lay around to him. Then said Abishai to David, God hath delivered thine enemy into thine hand this day. Now therefore, let me smite him, I pray thee, with the spear, even to the earth at once, and I will not smite him the second time. Abishai means business here. You give me one thrust of the spear and it's over. Right? This is serious. Verse 9, And David said unto Abishai, Destroy him not, for who can stretch forth his hand against the Lord's anointed and be guiltless? David said, Furthermore, as the Lord liveth, the Lord shall smite him, or his day shall come to die, or he shall descend into battle and perish. So David has absolute confidence in God's providence here. He's not going to take it in his own hands and kill the Lord's anointed. So David, a man after God's own heart, remember that's already said, I've selected a man after my own heart. Here it is. Here's how it's, it's exhibiting itself. I believe God. I'm not going to touch Saul. He's God's anointed. Verse 11, you know, and in verse 10, basically David said, this is how Saul's going to go, you know? I can wait. I know I've been anointed king, but God said, I'll be king. I'm not going to go, at, I'm not forcing it. Verse 11, the Lord forbid that I should stretch forth mine hand against the Lord's anointed, but I pray thee, take thou now the spear that is in his bolster and the cru cruise of water and let us go. So David took the spear and the cruise of water from Saul's bolster and they got them away and no man saw it nor knew it neither awakened, awaked, for they were all asleep, because a deep sleep from the Lord was fallen upon them. Then David went over to the other side and stood on top of the hill afar off, a great space between them. And David cried to the people and to Abner the son of Ner, saying, Answerest thou not, Abner? Can you imagine this? <laughs> he's, he's like on the other side of the, 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 there's a valley in between, he's far enough away, it's echoing, and he's calling to Saul's bodyguard, Abner, Abner! You slept on your duty. You're supposed to be protecting the king, right? That's the, that's the feel here. Verse 15, and David said to Abner, art thou not a valiant man? And who is like to thee in Israel? Wherefore then hast thou not kept thy lord the king? For there came one of the people in to destroy the king thy lord. This thing is not good that thou hast done. As, as the Lord liveth, ye are worthy to die because you have not kept your master. The Lord's anointed. And now see where the king's spear is in the cruise of water that was at his bolster. Essentially, you want proof that someone could have killed him? Look for his spear. Look for his water bottle, right? Verse 17. And Saul knew David's voice and said, Is this thy voice, my son David? And David said, It is my voice, my lord, O king. And he said, Wherefore doth my lord thus pursue after his servant? For what have I done, or what evil is in mine hand? Now therefore I pray thee, let my lord the king hear the words of his servant. If the Lord have stirred thee up against me, let him accept an offering. But if they be the children of men, cursed be, the, cursed be they before the Lord. For they have driven me out this day from abiding in the, inherit, in, the, in the inheritance of the Lord, saying, Go serve other gods. Now therefore let not my blood fall to the earth before the face of the Lord. For the king of Israel has come out to seek a flea, as when one doth hunt a partridge in the mountains." Then Saul said, I have sinned. Return, my son David, for I will no more do thee harm, because my soul was precious in thine eyes this day. Behold, here's the motto of his life. I have played the fool and have erred exceedingly. Saul fails, and he describes essentially his motto. Did you know that we are kings and priests unto God under theocratic kingship, King Jesus? All of us who live for self in preference to the will of God, we are playing the fool. Okay, so let's not do that. 
So he plays the fool, the kingship transitions. Um, his successor, your next blank there. His successor, David, though having shortcomings as a righteous king, and Israel prospers under him. Um, we have the story of 1 Samuel 17, Goliath being defeated by David. David um, is concerned about the glory of the Lord, not for his own, you know, killing his metaphorical giant. It is David said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come to you in the name of the Lord that the whole world may know that there is a God in Israel. And so if you read the, the entire book of 2 Samuel, 2 Samuel is essentially the book of David's reign. You might as well call it the book of David because it, it's his history as king. So he has been successful. 2 Samuel records the 40 years of David's life after he became king. The first 20 years are successful, right? He essentially puts Israel on the map. Um, David reorganizes worship. He divides the, 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 uh, the priesthood into divisions for service and singing. Uh, he writes poetry. He writes psalms. He, he becomes a military hero. I want you to see something that, that uh, historians have shown that plays a key role in the development of Israel. Turn to 1 Samuel chapter 13, verses 19 to 23. In 1 Samuel chapter 13, verse 19... We have the predicament that they are in because of their lack of resources. Now, remember when David came, saw his brothers fighting, and uh, the Goliath taunting the army? What's happening is <clears throat> that the Philistines, they, they, they have a technology to make weapons of war. And so the Israelites don't. They're dependent on the Philistines for weapons of war. Look what happened there in 1 Samuel verse 13, verse 19 to 23. There was no smith, a smithy, no sword spear maker. Okay? So there was no smith found throughout all the land of Israel. For the Philistines said, lest the Hebrews make them swords or spears. But all the Israelites went down to the Philistines to sharpen every man his share and his coulter and his axe and his mattock, his plow tools, the hose, the sickles, right? Yet they had a file for the mattocks and for the coulters and for the forks and for the axes and, so, and to sharpen the goads. So it came to pass in the day of battle that there was neither sword nor spear found in the land or in the hand of any of the people that were with Saul and Jonathan. But with Saul and with Jonathan, his son, there was found... Okay, you get the picture here? So when David comes, the only armor that's available is Saul's, and it's too big for him. They had no weapons. They were fighting with makeshift wood spears, farming tools. Historians and archaeologists say that David, when he was running from King Saul and lived in Philistine, Ziklag, remember where he acted like he was a crazy man foaming at the mouth? Ray Vanderlaan, in uh, That the World May Know, points out with some archaeologists as well as historians, when he's there in Philistine area, he takes the weapons-making technology back to Israel and helps, that helps him to form the army, which eventually puts Israel on the map and they begin to win wars. But anyway, that's just, you know, he becomes a military hero. It, it, however, the first 20 years, he's winning, he's winning, he's winning. But his, his successes lead to the temptation of unguardedness and indulgence in the flesh, and thus he sins in his uh, pursuit of Bathsheba. His triumphs turn into troubles. His sin bears bitter fruit, the last 20 years of his life is marked by gross sin and its consequences. Um, I'm going to summarize uh, Solomon's life. So when, when David dies, his son Solomon becomes king. That's your blank there. David's son Solomon becomes king upon David's death. Solomon rules righteously for, at, at the first and then drifts from the Lord. Okay, you can read about 1 Kings 3, 1 through 15, Solomon's about 12 to 15 years of age. 
he becomes king. He has a vision and, and, and a prayer in that dream or vision. He asks for wisdom, and God says, because you asked for this and not for that, I'm going to bless you. Um, turn to um, 1 Kings 4, and we'll just read a couple of portions here. So Solomon asks for wisdom in 1 Kings 3, verses 16 to, uh, verses uh, 1 to 15. And remember, his first test of wisdom is the women with one baby, the two babies, one died, the, 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 the harlots, the prostitutes. They're fighting over one baby, and he says, okay, cut the baby in half. And the real mother says, no, 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 don't. And so, you know, he's marked for being wise. But it wasn't spiritual wisdom which he was granted. It was administrative, practical wisdom. And, and if you read, let's read what it says there in 1 Kings verse, chapter 4, verse 29 to 34 about his wisdom. It says, 1 Kings 4, verse 29... And God gave Solomon wisdom and understanding exceeding much in largeness of heart. He had great generosity and capacity to learn, even as the sand that is on the seashore. And Solomon's wisdom excelled in the wisdom of all the children of the east country and all the wisdom of Egypt. For he was wiser than all men, than Ethan, the Ezraite, and Heman, and Kalkal, and Darda, the sons of Mahal. And his fame was in all the nations round about him. And he spake 3,000 proverbs, of which we have proverbs, right? And his songs were 1,005. And he spake of trees from the cedar tree that is in Lebanon, even unto the hyssop that springeth out of the wall. He spake also of beasts and of fowl and of creeping things and of fishes. And there came all people to hear the wisdom of Solomon from all the kings of the earth, which had heard of his wisdom. So he had it, he had it all, but then he failed too. Turn to chapter 11 now. We'll read six verses of 1 Kings 11. And we'll wrap it up. 1 Kings 11. What happened? How did he fail? We saw the failure of David. We we saw the failure of Saul. Now the wisest man. Verse 11, or chapter 11, verse 1. But King Solomon loved many strange women, together with the daughter of Pharaoh, women of the Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Zidonians, and Hittites, of the nations concerning which the Lord said unto the children of Israel, you shall not go in unto them, neither shall they come in unto you. For surely they will turn away your heart after their gods. Solomon clave unto these in love. And he had 700 wives, princesses, and 300 concubines, and his wives turned away his heart. For it came to pass when Solomon was old that his wives turned away his heart after the other gods. And his heart was not perfect with the Lord his God, as was the heart of David his father." So, he gave his heart to his wives, and they took him from the Lord. And he strays, and he lives for self for most of his entire life. However, I personally believe, and I think other scholars do too, he tires of living a life of self-will. And by the end of his life, he writes a book called Ecclesiastes a biography of how he tried to find satisfaction in everything except God. And I believe he repents and returns. This is the chief end of man, right? Fear God and obey his commandments, Ecclesiastes chapter 12. He returns at the end of his life to God. And thus we have the first three kings of Israel under the united kingdom. But because of his failures, it would lead to a divided kingdom, which we'll cover next week. All right. Any questions or comments on that? So that's just a flyover of the, of the first three kings, just so you understand. Don't play the fool. Always stay guarded, okay? Don't give your heart away to other loves. Paul? What is it? Yeah, let me, let me read it. Okay, I'll read uh, as we close. I'm going to read the last verse of Ecclesiastes, or the last couple verses. Yeah, the second to the last verse. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. 
Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. And this is a negative note. It ends on a negative note. For God will bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. So there we have the the rise and the fall of the first three kings of Israel. And uh, we'll see how it divides in the next uh, next uh, session that we have. All right. Um, thank you for those who are watching online. We're going to close for a time of prayer. Please pray with us, and we will see you next week.